Democrats combust over pro-life laws sweeping the country. President Trump presents his new immigration plan, and we check the mailbag. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. (laughs) Guys, we made it. It's a Friday. It's here. We're almost to the weekend. John Wick 3 comes out this weekend. That's all that matters. Also, Game of Thrones finale on Sunday. I mean, let's be honest, that's what everybody is looking forward to this weekend, right? Okay, but we'll get to all the actual news in just one second. First, let's talk about that coffee that you've been drinking. I guess when you open your bathroom up to anybody, you run the risk of stumbling across a needle or two. At least that's the case in some of our nation's coffee shops, unfortunately. For coffee without the needle, stick to black rifle coffee. If you are less interested in the social justice warrior mentality of your coffee company and more interested in quality coffee, you might instead want to check out Black Rifle Coffee, founded by former special ops vets, Black Rifle delivers the best roast-to-order coffee directly to your door. This guarantees you're getting fresh premium coffee with every single order. And Black Rifle's Coffee Club makes things supremely easy. Just pick your blend in the amount you want. Black Rifle ships your coffee directly to your door every month, hassle-free. No lines, no running out, just great coffee shipped direct to your door every single month. Plus, when you join their coffee club, you will receive discounts and offers that are not available to other customers. When you drink Black Rifle coffee, you are supporting a company that gives back to veteran and first responder causes, serves coffee and culture to those who truly love America. I know the founders of Black Rifle Coffee. They are awesome dudes. It is a fantastic company. Go check them out right now. No needles, no crime, just bold flavor. Freedom, 20% off your first purchase when you shop at blackriflecoffee.com slash Ben. That is blackriflecoffee.com slash Ben for 20% off your first purchase. That's blackriflecoffee.com slash Ben. Go check them out right now. Okay, so pro-life legislation sweeping the country. We have this Alabama bill, which is still generating most of the headlines. I think the reason for that is because it is the strictest bill. Also, because the left has an unusual dislike for the state of Alabama. They see the state of Alabama as retrograde. And so they feel it's easy to humiliate as opposed to, say, the more urbane Missouri or Louisiana. There are a bunch of states that have passed heartbeat bills at this point. Ohio has passed one. Michigan is working on one. Louisiana, Kentucky, Mississippi, Missouri. All of these places are passing pro-life bills. Right now, we talked yesterday about the strategy, what the strategy should be from a legal point of view. But there is very little question from a pro-life perspective that all of this is great stuff. That if you are pro-life, what you want is more of these bills that help protect the life of the innocent unborn. Now, the left is going berserk over all of this. It's funny. The left did not go berserk over New York's law, which suggested that abortion should be available even when a baby's head is coming into the birth canal. That's no problem. But when you talk about banning abortion past the fetal heartbeat, or when you talk about life beginning at conception, then people start to go a little crazy. And they start to make kind of ridiculous arguments. They try to suggest that a right to life that is inherent in the nature of being a human being, that if you support that right to life, you also have to support, you also have to support cradle to grave health care, for example, or you also have to adopt every kid who is not aborted. Just bad arguments cropping up everywhere. And we're going to go through a few of those bad arguments today because these bad arguments are, are becoming more and more common. The media are pressing forward with all of them. CNN had a guest named Coates. She's talking about the Alabama abortion law. Laura Coates, she's a former federal prosecutor, which of course makes her a constitutional expert. And she says that the Alabama abortion law is unconstitutional because there is a right to abortion in the Constitution. They actually have to have an appellate process. It'll make its way up through the courts before it's actually implemented at the lower levels, at the circuit court levels, to figure out if there will be a lower court to say that this is actually constitutional, which, frankly, as it's written right now, is not constitutional according to the Roe v. Wade precedent, because that is a a framework of trimesters. It relies on that old adage of your rights end where mine begin, and the state cannot intrude on a woman's right to have that private conversation until the fetus is viable outside the womb. The courts have looked at this issue and thought the trimester framework works. Okay, actually, that's not what the courts have found. What the courts have done is they reversed that in Planned Parenthood versus Casey. It was Roe versus Wade that instituted the trimester framework. Planned Parenthood versus Casey changed that trimester framework, just speaking in terms of constitutional law, to the undue burden standard, which says that you cannot unduly burden a woman's ability to get an abortion. That undue burden standard has allowed, for example, federal legislation like the Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act. Okay, with all of that said, is there anything in the Constitution that guarantees a right to an abortion? Of course not. Of course not. The founders would have been astounded at such an idea. The idea of a right to abortion in the Constitution is a perversion of the Constitution rooted in precisely the same sort of logic that allowed the Dred Scott decision to go forward. The two worst decisions in the history of the Supreme Court, the Dred Scott decision, which decided that black people were not people under the Constitution of the United States, and the Roe versus Wade decision, which decided that unborn people are not people under the Constitution 
of the United States. Both of those decisions are bad. Both of those decisions are wrong. And both are rooted in an interpretation of the Constitution called substantive due process. Now, you may think to yourself, that term seems like it is self-defeating. Process and substance are not the same thing. How can you have a substantive due process? Well, what that means is that we don't like the way that the process goes, not the process itself. We don't like that the law that is being applied is being applied at all, and therefore we are going to pretend that it is not done through a proper process. So normally, what due process of law means is that you have to have, for example, a jury trial for a criminal, for a criminal matter, or it means that you have to go through a legal process if you are going to remove someone's property from them. It does not mean, however, that the courts have a say on the status of the law itself that is being implemented. So for example, let's say that there's a law that says that you are not allowed to steal somebody else's car. And then there's a pro you steal somebody else's car, you go through a due process and we jail you. The courts do not have the ability to say, we don't like the law that says you can't steal somebody else's car because that is not due process. That doesn't make any sense. The process itself is due, you just don't like the substance of the law. What the court did in Dred Scott is they said, no, 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 we are now going to use the phrase due process to suggest that the substance of the law itself is wrong. And thus, for example, you have to return black, black former slaves, escaped slaves, back to their masters, which was the ruling in Dred Scott. Or under Roe v. Wade, substantive due process means that you have to go through a, a due process, by which we mean you have to allow women to have an abortion. There's nothing in the Constitution that suggests all of this. And you can tell that from the language of the Supreme Court cases that are on point on this. First, what happened is that the Supreme Court declared a right to privacy in a case called Griswold versus Connecticut, which was about whether a state could have laws on the books that banned the sale of contraceptives to non-married couples. Now, I think such laws are incredibly stupid. However, there's nothing in the Constitution that guarantees a right against the state with regard to the sale of contraceptives. There's just nothing there. Right? Obviously, the Constitution does not speak on this. The Supreme Court, however, in that case, declared that there was a broad right to privacy created by, quote unquote, emanations and penumbras from the first, third, fourth, fifth, and ninth amendments in Griswold versus Connecticut. And now, even if you believe there is a right to privacy that uh, emanates and creates penumbras, ooh, okay, even if you believe that crap, then that still, that right to privacy still would not encompass a very non-private decision to go to a third-party provider to snuff out a third party human life, which would be the baby's life in this particular case. In Roe, the Supreme Court didn't even bother with the legal analysis. They just said the right to privacy, whether it be founded in the 14th Amendment's concept of personal liberty and restrictions upon state action, or as we feel it is, in the Ninth Amendment's reservation of rights to the people, is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to terminate her pregnancy. This is completely absurd, obviously. The 14th Amendment explicitly guarantees a right to life, not just a right to liberty. So does the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution. The Fifth Amendment to the Constitution reads in relevant part that no person, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Well, it seems to me like being deprived of life because two people have met in a room and decided that you should be deprived of life is in fact a deprivation of life without due process of law. That's not a substantive due process argument. That is a due process due process argument. There's been no defense attorney for the baby. There's been no trial, nothing. Now, the people who are declaring this phantom right to privacy, it is, is worthy of note that we have now reached a bizarre point in America's constitutional history where the same people who declare phantom rights to health care, phantom rights to abortion, will state openly that there is no right to bear arms that the right to freedom of religion ought to be dramatically curtailed so that you can only practice religion in your own home if there. And political speech should be curtailed. You shouldn't be able to spend money on elections. Right? The same people who are willing to override virtually every right that is guaranteed in the Constitution of the United States in favor of a centralized top-down government that controls how we live, those same people are finding new rights in the Constitution that never existed before. It's really, really absurd. And Roe versus Wade and its establishment of the quote unquote right to abortion has to overlook the basic obvious fact that there is no definition of personhood other than human life. There is no other definition. What the left likes to do is they say, well, you know, there's human life and then there's personhood, just like there's sex and then there's gender. And just like gender for the left, the notion of personhood is completely malleable. It changes from time to time. The status of the person changes from time to time. And that means that the unborn person does not have rights because maybe personhood is dependent on heartbeat. Maybe personhood is dependent on viability. And that's why Justice Blackman writes in Roe versus Wade, we need not resolve the difficult question of when life begins. When those trained in the respective disciplines of medicine, philosophy, and theology are unable to arrive at any consensus, 
The judiciary, in this point in the development of man's knowledge, is not in a position to speculate as to the answer. Now, we all know when life begins. And Blackman, even right here, is conflating the beginning of life with personhood. But then the left will separate that and say, well, you know, it's, it is human life, but it is not personhood. Now, that, that obviously is silly talk. It's silly talk, which is why Peter Singer, who at least is a philosophically con consistent wild left ethicist at Princeton University, acknowledged in The Scotsman in 2009, quote, opponents will respond that abortion is by its very nature unsafe for the fetus. They point out that abortion kills a unique living human individual. That claim is difficult to deny, at least if by human we mean member of the species Homo sapiens, which is why at least Peter Singer is consistent enough to acknowledge that he's fine with killing a newborn baby after birth. He says killing a newborn baby is never equivalent to killing a person that is a being who wants to go on living because his standard for personhood is a person who has rationality, autonomy, and self-consciousness, which would rule out pretty much anybody who is mentally ill in a coma or hooked up to an iron lung. Now, the bad arguments continue along these lines. Liz Plank, who's a feminist, feminist thinker, she tweeted something out that is particularly absurd. We'll get to that in just one second. First, it is spring, the time of year when seeds grow into flowers and you grow up financially, at least. Your family needs protection. If something happens to you, that means you need life insurance. Thankfully, Policy Genius makes it easy to get that financial security without the growing pains. Policy Genius is the easy way to buy life insurance online. In just two minutes, you can compare quotes from top insurers and find your best price. Once you apply, the Policy Genius team will handle all the paperwork and the red tape. No commissions, no hidden fees, just financial protection and peace of mind, no strings attached. Policy Genius doesn't just simplify life insurance, they also make it easy to compare and buy home insurance, auto insurance, disability insurance. So the next time you stop to smell the roses, pull out your phone, head on over to policygenius.com. Policy Genius, spring is here. Kick it off by nipping life insurance in the bud. That's policygenius.com. Go check it out right now. Policy Genius, be a responsible adult. Make sure that your family is taken care of in case, God forbid, something should happen to you. And while you're at it, well, while you're at it, go take care of your home insurance, auto insurance, disability insurance. Go check them out at policygenius.com. The best way to get life insurance right this very moment. You can do it right now. You might pause what you're doing. Go do it. Policygenius.com. Okay, so Liz Plank is a feminist who had another relatively insane tweet. Th this debate drives people off the wall. I mean, it makes them totally crazy because once, if you believe that your way of life and your freedom is predicated on the ability to murder another human life, to get rid of another human life, and then somebody informs you that that is morally wrong, you're going to be insulted because your entire logic is rooted in a falsehood. And when you realize that that falsehood is a falsehood, you, you start to find that disquieting and insulting. I'm sure that there were slave owners in the South who spent their entire lives thinking, I'm a good person while holding slaves. Virtually all people think that they are good people. Probably they felt, I'm a good person. These black folks aren't actually people. These black folks are property. And then they were informed. No, those black folks are in fact people and you are mistreating them and you are being evil. I'm sure that was a disquieting notion to those people. If you spend your entire life dehumanizing another group of people, and then you are informed that this is immoral and wrong, and you have taken it to your heart that this is the essence of your right as a human being is to dehumanize this other form of human life, I can understand why people are upset. It is not an implicit, it is an explicit critique of your moral standing. No wonder people are getting upset. So Liz Plank, who's a feminist at Feministabulous over at Twitter, she says, behind millions of successful men is an abortion they don't regret getting with their partner. I urge men to go beyond solidarity and talk about how they've personally benefited from abortion rights too. Not because it's the right thing for you to do, but because it's true. Now, imagine the insane evil of this statement. Because there are millions of successful men who have been able to get away with having a more successful career by not having to support a child that they helped to create, they should be speaking out in favor of abortion too. Because, hey, successful career, man, based on the fact that I knocked some woman up and then she went and killed the baby. I mean, and that, that's great for me. Now, Elliot Broidy did this, right? He tried to pay off so the former head of the RNC Finance Committee. He tried to pay off a, a porn star that he had slept with and gotten pregnant. And we all thought, wow, that's really quite terrible, isn't it? But according to Liz Plank, it's really not that terrible. You know, he, his success was conditioned on the fact that he was willing to get rid of that baby. And if he'd gotten, maybe his life would be better now if the baby had been gotten rid of. It's amazing. You know who should really be thankful? One particular CNN commentator. We'll talk about it in just one second. So CNN's Jeffrey Tubin is the legal analyst over at CNN. And when, it, it's funny. People will say that men, men should not speak about abortion unless, unless those men happen to agree with the leftist perspective on abortion. You know who it seems to me should really not speak about abortion? Men who have a personal stake in the killing of babies. If you have a personal stake in getting rid 
of a third party life for your own political convenience, it seems to me this should probably invalidate your perspective on the issue. I think that you are not a good spokesperson for this issue. So you know who's not a good spokesperson for this issue? Jeffrey Tubin, who is the legal commentator on CNN. Here's Jeffrey Tubin getting very, very angry about abortion law. And then I will tell you a brief story about Jeffrey Tubin, which explains perhaps why he's, he's not a reliable commentator on this issue. Donald Trump said in the third debate with Hillary Clinton, if I get two or more appointments to the Supreme Court, automatically, that's the word he used, automatically Roe v. Wade will be overturned. And I think the president was exactly right. Roe v. Wade is gone, and every woman in Alabama who gets pregnant is going to be forced to give birth soon. And that's going to be true in Alabama, and it's going to be true in Missouri, and it's going to be true probably in Georgia. And that's what the law is because that's what the presidential election was about in part. Okay, well, Jeffrey Tubin, very upset about this. Now, when I say that Jeffrey Tubin's opinion means less than nothing to me, it means less than nothing to me. Why? Well, let's flash back all the way to 2010. New York Daily News, quote, Sunday could be a bittersweet first Mother's Day for Casey Greenfield. Greenfield is a pretty ginger-haired, Yale-educated lawyer and writer who last March gave birth to a love child. The baby's father is married CNN star and best-selling New Yorker writer Jeffrey Tubin. Ever since we broke the news of her pregnancy, Casey has remained silent about the baby drama, but now some of her friends are fed up with what they claim is less than gallant behavior on Tubin's part. Greenfield, now 36, was in her 20s when she fell for Tubin, now 49, even though he was wed to Amy McIntosh, the Harvard sweetheart he'd met in 1986 and who gave him two children. Jeff and Casey saw each other on and off for years, said one source. She was married to someone else for two years. After her divorce, she started seeing Jeff again. He said he was going to leave his wife for her, but by then, Casey had begun to distrust him. She suspected he had several other mistresses. In 2008, when Greenfield became pregnant, and when she told Tubin the news, he offered her money if she'd have an abortion, says a source. He also allegedly offered to pay for her to have another child later via a sperm donor. When Casey wouldn't have an abortion, Jeff told her she was going to regret it, that she shouldn't expect any help from him, claims another source. Greenfield underwent a risky DNA test while pregnant, but Tubin didn't provide his sample and stopped talking to her, according to sources. On the day she gave birth, Greenfield emailed Tubin, inviting him to meet his son Rory. A source said Tubin did not reply. Tubin ultimately cooperated with the DNA test that proved he was Rory's dad. In February, a Manhattan family court judge ordered him to pay child support. When he refused to pay the full amount, say the sources, Greenfield's lawyer threatened to notify his employers and garnish his wages. Tubin then paid up. Tubin now sees the 13-month-old lookalike heir. His wife Amy comes with them to the parks as a source. He's said to have asked to spend every other weekday with Rory. Casey isn't convinced he really wants to serve as a dad, says a friend. It may be legal maneuvering. It's been a hard couple of years for Casey, says a friend. She's a single mom, but her family couldn't be more supportive. The baby is such a joy for everyone. And that last line is really the one that matters. The baby is such a joy for everyone. But Jeffrey Tubin may, in fact, have a little bit of a stake in the abortion debate because, after all, he wanted to abort a love child for his own successful career. So, according to Liz Plank, he should actually be on the front lines of defending abortion. Obviously, it would have made his career so much easier if that baby had never lived. That would have been so much better for him. If you can't see the moral problem here, folks, I, I don't know what to tell you. Meanwhile, Democrats are upping the ante. The Colorado Secretary of State has now come forward and said that she wants to forbid employee travel to Alabama after this abortion ban. And we've seen similar stuff after North Carolina passed a law that was designed to protect businesses' ability to have separate bathrooms for men and for women. There were a bunch of states that said, well, we won't let our employees travel over to North Carolina. Well, now they're doing the same routine with Alabama. Yes, I am sure that Alabama will simply wither in the absence of Colorado state employees flying there for bureaucratic conferences. According to the Denver Post, employees of the Colorado Secretary of State's office won't be traveling to Alabama anytime soon. In a mostly symbolic gesture, yeah, no kidding, Secretary of State Jenna Griswold announced new restrictions Thursday, forbidding her staff from traveling to the state that just adopted the most stringent anti-abortion law in the nation. The ban is on work-related travel for employees of the Secretary of State's office. Griswold also called on the Election Center, a nonprofit training center for election officials, to relocate their training out of Alabama. I do wonder if this is constitutional, considering the Privileges and Immunities Clause. Is it constitutional to tell your own employees they are not allowed to visit a state on work-related business because you don't like that state? Also, just as a general rule, is this really good for the country? I disagree with all the policies in my native state, California. I think our policies suck, but I still live there, and I think it's worthwhile for people to visit there. We are still all Americans. These are all debates worth having. You know, I, we are moving dramatically toward the point where we can't live together anymore. 
You have restaurants that are turning people away on the basis of politics. You have people who are saying they won't visit other states based on state legislative policy. And we're, ta- we're not talking about state legislative policy, for example, that says that black people and white people have to have separate water fountains. We're talking about state legislative policy that says, for example, that you shouldn't be able to kill an unborn human life in the womb or that men and women should have separate bathrooms. If this is what we're coming to, it, it seems like we are cruising for a bruising as a country. A spokeswoman for the Colorado governor, Jared Polis, said he is not considering following Griswold's lead, but he did denounce the new law, obviously, because all Democrats are going to. Cory Booker went further. He said this is an assault on human dignity. The sort of Orwellian language being used by Democrats here is pretty astonishing. So it's an assault on human dignity not to be able to kill a human life in the womb. That's The assault on human dignity is really that you're not allowed to end another thing's life. That's, that's, that's really, I think, an assault on... Here's Cory Booker. The, the Spartacus-like senator from New Jersey. You know how extreme this is? It's, it literally says in the cases of rape and incest that a woman, st- it's still illegal for a doctor to perform an abortion. And so this is outrageous. This is an assault on human rights, human dignity, a freedom to control your body, which has been a fight going on from the founding of this country. Um, and I, I cannot uh, in any way... Um, uh, sit comfortably um, uh, while this is going on. And, and this, is so, this is a time in American history that mandates all of us to stand up and get involved in this fight. Wow, he, he can't sit silently as women are not allowed to kill unborn human life. I mean, he can't, in a state that he doesn't actually run, my, my goodness, what would happen then? In a second, I want to talk a little bit more about constitutional rights and the left's perspective on constitutional rights. Why what we're actually talking about with regard to Alabama and the nature of constitutional rights is danger for the, dangerous for the future of the country. First, let's talk about your hiring. Now, I know you've got a lot of great employees, but you need better employees or you need more great employees. Well, the best way to do that is to head on over to ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. ZipRecruiter is fantastic. It sends your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards. They don't stop there. With their powerful matching technology, ZipRecruiter scans thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience and then invites them to apply to your job. As applications come in, ZipRecruiter analyzes each one and spotlights the top candidates so you never miss a great match. ZipRecruiter is so effective that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the very first day. I'll admit it. Now, I've been trying to use ZipRecruiter for years to get rid of Michael Knowles, but we've never actually posted on ZipRecruiter to get rid of Michael Knowles, which is why we haven't been able to do so. As soon as I do that, I know we will find someone superior to Michael Moles. I mean, that, that's because ZipRecruiter is also great. And also because if I threw a rock into a crowd and hit somebody, that person would be better than Michael Moles. Right now, my, listener can, my listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash D-A-I-L-Y-W-I-R-E. ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. ZipRecruiter is indeed the smartest way to hire. Go check them out right now. ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. So the left's perspective on the Constitution is that the Constitution is just supposed to give them whatever they want, and it's never supposed to take away something that they like. That is their perspective on the Constitution of the United States. Now, Tim Ryan, who is a congressperson from Ohio, who's now running for president, another one of these quixotic campaigns, he was on NBC News yesterday. And he's openly saying that he would have a litmus test when it comes to Supreme Court justices. Would they uphold Roe v. Wade? Now, it's pretty amazing because the left has said we should never have litmus tests when it comes to Supreme Court justices. We should never be able to ask a Supreme Court justice how they would rule on Roe v. Wade, for example. I disagree with that. I'm glad for this sort of this sort of transparency from Tim Ryan. He wants to ask justices straight up if they would overrule Roe v. Wade, one of the worst argued and, and reasoned constitutional decisions in American history. Here he is explaining the Constitution should basically be a a hacky sack for him to kick around. If you're president, would you essentially have a a row litmus test for judges? Yeah. Yeah, I would. Most definitely. This is not something to be messed with. Pure and simple. Not at this at this moment in history. People could try to dance around it. I will. You know, Mm -hmm. I will have someone who will protect Roe v. Wade. No question about it. Okay, so, you know, again, Democrats see the Constitution as a way of protecting crap they like. They do not see it as an actual document that embeds certain values. And that's why it's funny. You see so many people on the left who have been cheering New Zealand. So in the aftermath of the Christchurch shooting, the evil terrorist attack on a mosque in New Zealand, the Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern was pushing all sorts of supremely harsh anti-gun regulations. And she was also criminalizing, by the way, even downloading 
the manifesto of the shooter, which seems like a tremendous violation of basic free speech principles, even though I've said publicly, I don't think anybody should read that piece of crap. And I hope the guy burns in hell. In any case, New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, she said she doesn't understand the U.S. And what's amazing is this is being passed around by folks on the left like, yeah, I don't get it either. I don't get it either. Here is Jacinda Ardern saying she doesn't understand why the U.S. is taking so long on its gun regulations. Over 110 mass shootings in the United States since 1982. You know, even President Obama couldn't do that in the United States after the the massacre of children at yeah. Sandy Hook. You can draw a line and say that that does not mean that you need access to military-style semi-automatic weapons and assault mm -hmm. rifles. You do not. And New Zealanders, by and large, absolutely agreed with that position. Australia experienced a massacre and changed their laws. New Zealand had its experience and changed its laws. To be honest with you, I do not understand the United States. Right. She doesn't understand the United States because we do have a constitution that embeds particular values. The fact that there are so many people on the left who cheer this, that Ardern could simply, from her perch as prime minister, change the laws overnight. That explains why we do have a constitution, which is to protect the American people from the violation of their rights, including the unborn, from violations of their rights. Okay, now, meanwhile, President Trump has presented a new immigration plan. The immigration plan is generally directed at legal immigration systems. He wants a merit-based immigration system. And he also wants to strengthen border protections. Now, the left says this is not enough, obviously. The New York Times editorial board is very upset because Trump didn't say that he's going to re-enshrine DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program that protects the so-called dreamers. You know, people who arrived in the United States as children or teenagers and have been here for years. Now, the reason Trump doesn't mention that is because that is his negotiation point with Democrats. If he simply lays out, you know what, my goal is to legalize DACA, then the minute that he says that, Democrats are going to say, okay, how about we take that and none of the rest? Right? This is how deal making is done. You say what you want, and then you know what the other person wants. They don't want to give you something. So you say, I'm going to withhold the thing you want until I give you. I'm going to withhold the thing you want until you give me what I want. Right? I mean, that's how a trade works. If Donald Trump were to say, here are all the things I want, including to re-enshrine DACA, Democrats would simply say, okay, fine. So what are you waiting for? Re-enshrine DACA, and then we'll talk. Trump doesn't want to do that. That's his goal. Right? His goal is to have a negotiation here. So President Trump gave a, an address in the Rose Garden unveiling his plan to create a fair, modern, and lawful system of immigration for the United States. He points out that Democrats, by contrast, are proposing open borders, lower wages, and lawless chaos, which seems to me at this point a fairly good description of what Democrats are doing, considering they don't even want to fund ICE to the, and, and the Department of Homeland Security with the beds necessary to house people crossing the border illegally pending legal action. Here's President Trump explaining. We must implement an immigration system that will allow our citizens to prosper for generations to come. Today, we are presenting a clear contrast. Democrats are proposing open borders, lower wages, and, frankly, lawless chaos. We are proposing an immigration plan that puts the jobs, wages, and safety of American workers first. Okay, so... All of this is correct. Democrats, unfortunately, are not treating the immigration issue with sufficient seriousness. President Trump also says we need to get rid of the random lottery that decides who gets to become an American. He says that's a really dumb policy. It is a really dumb policy. There is no reason it should be randomized. We should be able to look at the pool of immigrants and decide who best serves America's interests. We are a country with borders. Now, I am libertarian personally on immigration so long as there is no welfare state. So here, here, are, my, here are my conditions on immigration to the United States. No taking advantage of welfare. Also, you should have some skill set that is going to add to the United States so that you don't come in and are unemployed. Also, you should be willing to assimilate. Now, the only reason, again, that you should not be, that you should have some skill set is because, in my view, that, that that is necessary in a state that does have a welfare benefit to it. You know, back in the early 20th century, there were effectively no welfare benefits, and this drew a crowd of people who were very risk-seeking coming to the United States wanting to assimilate learning English, assimilating to American values, and then going and working really hard. Assimilation in the United States today is a little bit different because people are coming in. There are tremendous state benefits that are available. There's bilingual education in many places around the United States. All of this draws a different, not, not necessarily worse in every way, but a different pool of people, obviously. When President Trump says, why as a sovereign country should we have a random selection of people who come into the country? It's stupid. He is correct about this. Currently, 66% of legal immigrants come here on the basis of random chance, 
they're admitted solely because they have a relative in the United States, and it doesn't really matter who that relative is. Another 21 percent of immigrants are issued either by random lottery or because they're fortunate enough to be selected for humanitarian relief. Random selection is contrary to American values and blocks out many qualified potential immigrants from around the world who have much to contribute. Okay, this, of course, is exactly right. This is exactly right. The fact that, that, that we have to select people who come in as opposed to random selection is obviously correct. Trump concludes by saying immigration has to be based in merit. This is silly. Why are we not doing a merit-based system? Obviously. Our proposal fulfills our sacred duty to those living here today while ensuring America remains a welcoming country to immigrants joining us tomorrow. And we want immigrants coming in. We cherish the open door that we want to create for our country. But a big proportion of those immigrants must come in through merit and skill. Okay, so all of this is true. Now, in a second, I'm going to show you how Democrats can't even be reasonable about all of this. There is a deal to be made. Democrats hate Trump so much that they're not going to make the deal. They think Trump is hated so much that they never have to make a deal. We'll talk about that in just a second. First, you have to go and subscribe at dailywire.com. When you do, you get so many wonderful things. For $9.99 a month, you get a subscription to this show. That means that you get two additional hours of this show every single day. It is just fantastic. You get to do it on demand. You can watch it from your desk at work while you pretend to do work, like all sorts of great stuff. Also, you get extra access to our Sunday special that comes out on Saturday for you. Plus, we have questions that we ask behind the paywall that you don't get unless you are a subscriber. You get to ask questions. As I say, we're doing the mailbag today. You get to ask questions in the mailbag. All of that is awesome. When you spend $99 a year, you also get this. Boom. Very greatest in all beverage vessels. Leftist tears, hot or cold tumbler. How great is this beverage vessel? How great is it? It can be used to nourish babies. It is that glorious time of the week where we give a shout out to a Daily Wire subscriber today. Isaiah Marillo on Instagram has done the one thing every parent knows to do, which is give your tiny adorable baby a leftist tears tumbler instead of a bottle. This baby, by the way, is freaking cute. That is a cute baby. In this photo, baby Sunnery is taking a big sip of some sweet, sweet leftist tears and looking just adorable doing it. That baby is so cute. Oh my goodness. Isaiah writes, behold, the greatest of all beverage vessels. Indeed it is, Isaiah. Indeed it is. Fantastic picture. Thank you to Baby Sunnery and Isaiah for your support. Man, that, that, that's the winner so far. We've had a bunch of great pictures come in. That baby is adorable. I love babies. <laughs> that baby is adorable. Okay, so go check us out also at YouTube and iTunes. We were the second most downloaded podcast in all of America, which means all of the world, last month. Make us number one by going to YouTube and iTunes and subscribing and leaving us a review. We always appreciate it. We are the largest, fastest growing conservative podcast and radio show in the nation. <laughs> So it's amazing. President Trump proposes a merit-based immigration proposal. And the Democrats are like, nope, no merit. We don't want merit. We just want whomever, doesn't matter. Now, that is bad policy just on its face. If I say to you, you know, you run a business and you want the best people, which is why you should have ZipRecruiter, for example. You want the best people. And you're like, no, I don't. I just want whoever walks through that door first. I'm going to say, well, your business is going to be bankrupt pretty quickly. Or if you you have relatives and some of them are criminals and some of them are not. You're going to pick and choose who you want to invite to the family reunion. Nancy Pelosi, however, says standards are bad. No more standards. It's condescending. Stop it. To brief the members, we always uh, would welcome that. and We'll see what they have to say. Uh, but I want to just say something about the word that they use, merit. It is really a condescending word. Are they saying family is without merit? Are they saying most of the people have ever come to the United States in the history of our country are without merit because they don't have an engineering degree? Uh, certainly, we want to attract the best in our country, uh, to our country, and that includes many people uh, from many parts of society. Okay, so the fact that, that she says that merit is very bad is amazing, amazing. Okay, there's no inherent merit in being somebody's relative. Are you, I'm against legacy admissions to colleges, for example. I think that you should have to merit to get in. Nancy Pelosi is now standing against merit. Merit is condescending. That's an amazing statement. My favorite Nancy Pelosi statement about Trump's immigration plan, though, is this one, where she explains 
every illegal immigrant has a spark of divinity. Now, that is 100% true. That does not answer the question as to what our migration policy should be. It means we shouldn't treat people inhumanely. It doesn't mean we have to let everybody in. But Nancy Pelosi says every illegal immigrant has a spark of divinity. Unborn children, no. Every illegal immigrant, yes. Also, abortion on demand, you can kill babies on demand as long as they're in the womb. And every illegal immigrant thus has a right to stay in the United States because of the spark of divinity. I'm, I'm going to need her to explain. We've always said that it's, it gets to be more of a humanitarian crisis the more the Republican, the administration, I won't paint all the Republicans with this, the uh, more the administration acts in the shameful way, not consistent with our faith, with our belief that every person is, has dignity and worth that every person has a spark of divinity within them that we need to respect and that we have that spark of divinity that we need to act upon. Okay, so again, it's, the, the language here is amazing. So babies, no spark of divinity. Illegal immigrants, yes, spark of How about that everybody has a spark of divinity and then we can deal with migration policy. But migration policy is not, you get to kill the illegal immigrant, unlike baby policy, which apparently is you get to kill the baby as often as you want. Okay, time for some mailbag. Let's mailbag it up a little bit. So. Today's mailbag, Josiah says, Hi, Ben. Jamie Metzl has discussed the idea of genetic modification. In this process, around 15 female eggs would be fertilized to help one pick the genetically superior human. Of course, the eggs not picked would be discarded. Is there a scientific argument against this? My fear is that oftentimes morals tend to collapse when things become expedient. Thanks, Josiah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not in favor of the use of in vitro fertilization that ends with the discarding of fertilized eggs, of, of embryos. In fact, there have been questions about this in Alabama. People talking about why are you not protecting I'm in favor of protecting the fertilized eggs that are outside the womb. They don't have to be in the womb to be incipient human life and thus worthy of protection. Greg says, hey, Ben, big fan here. Most of you views I align with, but as a classical liberal, I simply cannot agree with you on pro-life laws. The question, however, is not a debate over abortion talking points, which have been debated ad nauseum by both sides. My question is, why do we not concede to any moral equivalency in terms of killing animals? I'm mostly talking about the fight against inhumane killing and torture of animals in slaughterhouses, beating pigs and cattle senseless, disemboweling them without anesthetic, for example, as I'm sure you're aware of, luring thousands of dolphins into a tiny cove in Japan and stabbing them brutally to death with spears. Are we not all creatures of God? We all play a role in the planet's ecosystem. This kind of cruelty is unconscionable. Where do we draw that line and why is this okay? But an, aborting an embryo with no nervous system, brain or brainstem is a grave moral sin. Thanks, Ben. Love the show. I'll always be a subscriber. Well, I appreciate it, Greg. So the basic answer here is that human life is worth more than other types of life. Human life is worth more than other types of life. And it is not a matter of the stage of development of the human life. Human life is inherently worth more because human beings are endowed with individual human characteristics. They're members of the species Homo sapiens and thus deserve greater protections. They will have the capacity to reason. They do have the capacity. If they do not, that is, that is a shortcoming, but that does not invalidate their membership in the human species. Humans are worth more is the short answer. Humans have a soul from a religious perspective, from a non-religious perspective. We all sort of agree that humans are worth more than animals. Otherwise, presumably you'd be a Janus, which there are some people who are, but I don't see most people doing that. Now, as to the mistreatment of animals, I will admit to you that I am ideologically driven toward vegetarianism or veganism. Uh, I, I have a tough time reconciling being humane with the eating of animals. Animal protein is necessary, particularly for children. I hope that we soon develop substitutes for the killing of animals for food. Um, I, I think that would be a very good thing on just the hum humane level. Um, I will admit to hypocrisy on this. I don't live up to my own standards. I haven't actually tried a, a vegetarian diet. Um, and that's not specifically out of, of love of meat, although I really do love meat. Uh, it really is more specifically out of probably convenience. But the fact is that uh, I hear the argument for the humane treatment of animals, and uh, I sort of agree with it, to be frank. Mark says, Dear Ben, you have mentioned several times about places such as 4chan, 8chan, other sites. You have stated some horrible things are stated here. I agree. You have said some legitimately bad people have posted on these sites and mill around on these sites. My question is, where's the divide between people posting horrible things on the internet because they can, and they, in a phrase, want to watch the world burn, and the people who actually believe in what they're posting and when should we treat it as such? Well, once you move away from saying terrible things about people and evil things, and you move into overt threats of violence or support for overt threats of violence, then you have crossed a the line. There is a difference in American law and every form of common law between speech and incitement. Incitement actually has to incite. It has to be go kill X. So what I've seen is on 8chan, for example, there is this, uh, this person who was hanging out, I believe he's on 8chan, who was arrested by the FBI a couple of weeks ago. 
He was threatening me. He was threatening Donald Jr. He was threatening Jared Kushner. There's an FBI arrest of this guy. I believe he was hanging out on some of these message boards, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I know that after he was arrested, there were message boards where people were saying things like, next time, just go shoot Shapiro and don't post about it on the message board and we'll all know why you did it. And now I think that you should probably be monitored <laughs> for the sake of safety because you're actively advocating violence against a specific another human being. Um, with, with that said, I think the vast majority of the of the nastiness that I receive, and I receive an awful lot of it, is protected by the First Amendment, should be protected by the First Amendment. And while I don't think it's harmless to the public discourse, I don't think that it's something that earns you government, government, you know, oversight. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jackson says, hey, Ben, what is the logic behind insider trading being illegal? If I'm able to know secrets about a company that would make my shares of the company change, why should I not be allowed to act upon those secrets to my own gain? Thanks. Love the show. Well, there is a very solid libertarian case that insider trading should not be illegal. That one of the benefits of working for the company is that you should be able to trade on the insider information. And that actually would create more transparency in the market because everyone would just follow whatever the CEO of the company is doing. You'd actually have quicker transparency to market. Attempting to police insider trading has very largely been a fool's errand. I, I sort of agree with the libertarian case. Larry Elder makes this case pretty eloquently. Again, it should be, you know, I, if you have a privately owned company and you're involved in the decision making of the company, you own stock in the company and your decisions are designed to raise the stock of the company. Now, I guess the, the case against insider trading, presumably, would be, let's say that you're trying to short sell the company, right? that you decide that you're going to deliberately tank the stock of your company in order to, uh, a publicly traded company, and harm the other stockholders in order to get all of the all of the benefit. That's not an insider trading thing, though. That is a breach of fiduciary duty, and that's a crime in and of itself. So I'm not sure that insider trading has to be on the table in order for that to be a crime. Breaches of fiduciary duty are, in fact, financial fraud, and you will go to jail for that. Daniel says, hey, Ben, I'm currently in Poland on a study abroad trip in which we are exploring different Holocaust sites. One thing my professor has continued to bring up is that Jews do not believe that a child is a life until it passes through the birth canal. I was wondering if you could provide me with more context as the actual Jewish standards on abortion and when it would be considered acceptable. Thank you, Dan. So there's a, a rich debate in Jewish literature about when a when an unborn human child is considered a full life. Uh, technically, it's between two great sages in Jewish history, Rashi and Rambam. Uh, Rashi basically suggests that it's not a human life up to point of birth, or at least not, not a full, it's not fully equated with the rights of a, of a born human. And Rambam seems to suggest otherwise. The, the Talmud in Tractate Sanhedrin talks at length about this particular issue. But when it comes to the laws about abortion, when it comes to whether you are allowed to abort, Judaism is fully pro-life. Judaism is indeed pro-life. The basic rule in Judaism is that there are no abortions. Abortions are not allowed, except in the cases where the mother's life is in danger. That is the basic standard. Now, you, you, sometimes you can go to a rabbi and you can get what's called a heter. Uh, that means that you can get some sort of leniency. But the baseline standard is this, right? For the sake of clarity, for the sake of clarity, let's talk about some of the great rabbis for just a second. The position of virtually all of the greatest rabbis of the 20th century, from Rav Moshe Feinstein, who considered abortion murder, to Rav Shlomo Zalman Arbach, who agreed, to Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik, who also agreed, he said in 1975, to me it is something vulgar, this clamor of the liberals that abortion be permitted, to Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, who said that abortion is biblically prohibited past three months and at least rabbinically prohibited before then. So this is why I have said for a very long time, the presence of human life means that this has worth. That does not mean that the worth is exactly equivalent to the worth of a five-year-old child, but it does mean that the life is deserving of the same protections as a five-year-old child would receive. Again, rabbis do argue on the level of exceptions permitted, but even the rabbis who are considered more lenient on abortion agree that it is prohibited ipso facto they just consider more exceptions acceptable. But there is not a single Jewish opinion, not one, that supports the mainstream pro-choice position on abortion, which is that it's the woman choice at any point in the pregnancy. There is no, zero, zero Jewish sages have ever backed such an idea, ever, ever, ever. As Rabbi Aharon Lichtenstein explained, even if we were to accept that it is indeed a woman's own body, we totally reject the conception that she can do with it as she pleases. This is a completely anti-halachic perception. Halacha is, is merely Jewish law. So all of this is, is you know, people who claim that Judaism is cho pro-choice are simply lying about it. All the talk about the, 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 there's a section in the Talmud where it talks about the status of the fetus as being akin to water for the first 40 days. Well, th there is a question as to whether that is talking about the legal status for purposes of ritual purity. And right? that's the typical way that it is explained. 
That, that gets into some very abstruse areas of Jewish law that I don't frankly have time to go into right now. But suffice it to say that just quoting all of that and then, pret- and then pretending that, that that is dispositive as to the nature of Jewish law and abortion, is, it's a lie. It's not true. Chaya says, hey, Ben, my friend and I had an argument recently on the issue of trying to reconcile modern science with some of the biblical narratives. She doesn't understand how one can fully believe in Genesis and the Torah and yet also believe in accepted scientific theories like evolution or the Big Bang Theory. What's your take on this? Do you believe creation actually happened in six days? And if you do, how do you reconcile this with theories like evolution? Thank you so much for both massive fans of the show. So there's a great book that I recommended on the show, would have been uh, three weeks ago, called um, uh, Science. Uh, uh, what is it? It's by Gerald Schroeder, uh, Ger- uh, or Gerard Schroeder, Gerald Schroeder. Uh, and his book is all about reconciling b- the Bible with modern science. He's written a bunch of books on this, as The Science of God is the one that I recommended. He specifically talks about the six days and how six days of earth time matches up to the biblical, uh, matches up to the scientific timeline. The, the idea of the Big Bang absolutely matches up with the biblical narrative. Remember that for most of human history, the scientifically urbane perspective was that, was that the universe had always existed, would always continue to exist, that, that the universe was eternal. And then science moved toward the Big Bang and scientists were very upset with this at the time. They thought, oh my God, this, this tends to sound a lot too much like the Bible. It was, it was very disquieting for a lot of scientists, which is why many scientists have now started to rely on multiple universes theory. Brian Keating has a great video for Prager University talking about the multiple universes theory and how it's unprovable, just as unprovable uh, as, as the presence of God in the universe, for example. Um, as far as the, the creation story, the creation narrative actually matches up quite well with the, with the path of evolution Again, I recommend that you check out Gerald Schroeder's book. He talks about this at length. Alyssa says, hey, Ben, my name is Alyssa. I'm a college student from San Diego. I wanted to know besides Harvard, what other great law schools are there to apply to? Thanks for all you do, big fan. Well, Alyssa, I mean, there there are a bunch of great law schools. Yale Law School is a great law school. Not as good as Harvard, but Yale's pretty good. University of Chicago has a great law school. Uh, Columbia has a great law school. Uh, And the reality is that where you go to law school is much more about credentialing than about learning the law. It's really a filtering system. There are a lot of great law schools that are quote unquote secondary law schools. UCLA is a great law school. USC has a very good law school. University of Texas has a great law school. So it depends on sort of what you want to do. Amy says, would making birth control available over the counter subside the result of unwanted pregnancies? Well, birth control is widely available uh, and that has has done some work in preventing unwanted pregnancy, obviously. Uh, it has not done all the work because we still have nearly a million abortions a year in the United States. Hank says, Ben, I'm traveling to Jerusalem in a few weeks to work on an archeological dig outside of Jerusalem. Do you know of any sites I should visit well in the city other than the more well-known sites like the Western Wall and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre? Uh, well, th- there are a bunch of sites. In Jer- so his, uh, Hezekiah's water tunnels are super cool. They're the, the tunnels that were built to withstand siege from foreign parties, and they, they go for hundreds of yards. Uh, it, there's, there's a great book called The Source by James Missioner, where he discusses a lot of the archaeological sites around Jerusalem, and it really is fantastic. He names a bunch of the sites that are worthwhile visiting. Uh, another one that is absolutely worthwhile visiting are the, the Kotel tunnels. So everybody knows about visiting the Western Wall, but you should actually go to the tunnels. There are tunnels that dig down. The wall of the, the, the Western Wall goes down another 30 feet, probably. And you can actually see that. You can actually take the tunnels below the Temple Mount. It's, it's really cool stuff. Patrick says, hey, Ben, love the show. You help me lose my mind. You help me not lose my mind when I'm in San Diego with the military. I've been having multiple conversations with friends of mine who are way more liberal than I. I tend to align very much with you. When discussing the beginning of a human life, her response to separate DNA, 46 chromosomes, etc., was, that doesn't matter to me. I have no idea how to respond to this besides agreeing to disagree. Well, I mean, facts don't matter to me means the end of the conversation. By the way, so do character attacks. If somebody makes a character attack on you and they're intent on smearing your character, you have every right not to engage in the conversation anymore. Elijah says, hey, Ben, huge fan of yours. I went as, I went as far as to name my dog after the 30th president, Calvin Coolidge. What are your thoughts on Coolidge as president? So I am generally a big Coolidge fan. I think Coolidge was wildly underrated. I'm very much in favor of chief executives who don't talk a lot and don't do a lot and just are there. And that was Coolidge's perspective. So I'm generally a Coolidge guy. Okay, time for some things I like and then some things that I hate. So things that I like. Uh, there is a series on Netflix that is, is really good for the acting. The series is called Dead to Me with Christina Applegate and Linda Cardellini, who's been in everything lately. I don't know, we're in like the Linda Cardellini boom right now. She's terrific in it. Christina Applegate is actually probably even better. And she, she's really, really good in it. But the acting in the show is great. James Marsden is in it as well. Um, the, the show is certainly rated R. And the ending of the first season is a little bit too, should I say woke? 
I, I don't think woke is, is the proper term, but it, it basically, it, dead to me is, is sort of the flip. It's sort of just another spin on Big Little Lies, effectively. But I enjoyed Big Little Lies, and so I enjoyed Dead to Me. Here's a little bit of the trailer. Just heat it up at 300 and leave it in for 35 minutes. Thanks, Karen. It's Keep my take great. on Mexican lasagna. Great. Jeff and I can't imagine what you're going through. Well, it's like if Jeff got hit by a car and died suddenly and violently. Like that. Well, you get that dish back to me whenever yep. you can. Welcome to Friends of Heaven. Looks like we have some new people here today. I'm Judy. Jen. I hope this isn't weird. Can I give you a hug? No. Okay. I lost my fiance Ooh. eight weeks ago. It was really sudden. So the, the show the show is, is well written. It's good. It's from it's produced by Will Ferrell and Adam McKay, which is usually a pretty good producing team. Uh, again, see, w I live in a world where I'm happy to recommend the art of others, even if I disagree with them politically. I know this is getting unique out there, but I, I actually enjoyed the show. I think that it's worth the watch. Okay, other things that I like today. So Bill de Blasio is having a rough one. No one knows why he's running. I mean, he can't even run his own city, and now he wants to run the country. And everybody is, is super confused about it. So he was being grilled on Good Morning America. It didn't go great for him. Say it's a tough city. We're hearing it outside. Some protesters. A little came. serenade, George. A little serenade. Morning. But it's not only that. There's a poll about a month ago, Quinnipiac poll, that showed 76% of New York voters, 73% of New York Democrats say you shouldn't run. So what should the rest of the country think when so many of your fellow New Yorkers are saying don't run? You know, I got elected mayor, but 73% of the vote originally reelected with 67% of the vote. I think you'd agree that the poll that actually matters is the election. So New Yorkers have twice said that they want me to lead them. And I think about polling in general, it's not where you start, it's where you end. Um, no, 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 no. So there's a poll that says, would you like Bill de Blasio to be your mayor? That happens on election day. And New Yorkers, because many New Yorkers are foolish when it comes to their votes. Like, yeah, let's get let's have the commie do it. That is not the same thing as let's have him run the country. See, when I hire a plumber, it's because I think he's going to be good at plumbing, not because I think he's a great accountant. And even if I hire a plumber, that does not mean that the plumber I hire for my home is going to be the one that I hire to do my office building. Like, what, what in the world? Bill de Blasio, dude, that, that guy, that is, a, that is a candidacy that is going nowhere very, very quickly. Okay, time for a couple of things that I hate. It's very exciting to hear the advocates of science on the left. You know, the people who are very inspired when Bill Nye sets a globe on fire with a blowtorch. It's very inspiring to hear those people explain that human life does not begin at conception. It apparently begins whenever you want it to begin. You know, I think that according to the, life begins at 40. Human life begins at 40. That's what, that's what I've been told. So in any case, other things about science they do not like, sex. Like, like the fact that there are sexes. They do not like this thing. And this has some predictably idiotic and terrible results. There's a story from the Associated Press today. It's called Blurred Lines, A Pregnant Man's Tragedy Tests Gender Notions. Okay, a couple things. One, there is no such thing as a pregnant man. Does not exist, has not existed, will never exist. This is a biological woman who has had hormone treatments. That is what we are talking about right now. So why did something bad happen? Because we insist on humoring people over their self-identification of gender, even in the stupidest possible circumstances, including medical circumstances. So let's say that you identify, you're, you're a woman, a biological woman, but you identify as a man. When you go into the doctor, wouldn't you want to tell the doctor that you are a biological woman? That's going to matter to the diagnosis. It's absurd. If you have abdominal pain and you're, a, you're listed on your chart as a man, and now you look like a man because you've had face sculpting surgery and because you've had hormone treatments and you've had uh, mastectomy and all of this, and you've done all these things, wouldn't you still want to tell the doctor about your biology because your abdominal pain might be something you think that it is not? Okay, because it might be that your abdominal pain is coming from, say, a uterus that you still have. That's exactly what happened in this story. Quote, when the man arrived at the hospital with severe abdominal pains, a nurse didn't consider it an emergency, noting that he was obese and had stopped taking blood pressure medicines. In reality, he was pregnant, a transgender man in labor that was about to end in a stillbirth. No, he was not pregnant. She was pregnant. And if she had not lied to the doctors about her biological sex, maybe the baby would still be alive. That's what happened here. And for us to pretend that it's the job of the medical profession now to screen men for female disorders or for female problems or to screen women for prostate disorders is absurd. So 99.99% .99 of the population is not going to, it can be divided into sex for purposes of medical care. And now you're telling me that doctors are going to have to be re-educated in their implicit bias so that if a man walks in 
They're now going to do what? A pregnancy test on him? They're going to pee on a stick? And when a woman walks through the door, you're going to make sure that you give her a prostate exam? Men and women are different. Their biology is different. This is absurd. According to the AP, the tragic case described in Wednesday's New England Journal of Medicine points to larger issues about assigning labels or making assumptions in a society increasingly confronting gender variations in sports, entertainment, and government. But I've been told that gender and sex are completely malleable. I've been told also that gender and sex, controversially or, or conversely, are completely dichotomous, that gender has nothing to do with sex and sex has nothing to do with gender. So if that's the case, why are you writing your gender on a medical chart? This, this idiocy, no, it doesn't point to larger issues about assigning labels. It points to the larger issue about lying about your biology on a medical chart, you dopes. The point is not what happened to this particular individual, but this is an example of what happens to transgender people interacting with the healthcare system, says the lead author of this study, Dr. Daphna Strumsa of the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Well, no, actually, the point is what happened to this particular individual because this particular individual lied on their medical chart about their sex. He was rightly classified as a man in the medical records and appears masculine, said Strumsa, but that classification threw us off from considering his actual medical needs. He was not rightly classified as a man. He was rightly classified as a woman because he was a she, because men do not get pregnant. This is so absurd. The 32-year-old patient told the nurse he was transgender when he arrived at the emergency room and his electronic medical record listed him as male. Well, if your electronic medical record lists you as male but doesn't say that you are transgender and you just told the nurse that, that's a problem. Maybe you need a different designation on the electronic medical records. But how you identify in your head is of no consequence to your medical treatment. The way that this person should have been diagnosed is as a woman who is receiving hormone replacement therapy because that's biologically what we are talking about right here. Okay, the stupidity never ends. Here's another Associated Press on this stupidity. So Snapchat has a new silly filter. Okay, it's a new photo filter that allows users to change into a man or a woman with the tap of a finger. But it's not necessarily fun in games for transgender people. Some say it reduces their very real and often painful experiences to folly. Okay, and the headline is, my gender is not a costume. For trans people, gender swap photo filters are no mere game. So let me get this straight. If you're a woman and you feel that it is insulting for a man to have surgeries and then call himself a woman, you are a bigot. But if you're a transgender woman and you feel that it is insulting for a Snapchat filter to show a picture of what a man would look like as a woman, then you have every right to be offended. Oh, so I guess that, so just to, just to get this straight, it is cultural appropriation of transgender people if there's a Snapchat transgender filter, but it is not cultural appropriation of the opposite sex to say that you are an actual member of the opposite sex and then get hormone replacement therapy and surgery to pretend to be a member of the opposite sex in biology, in appearance. Oh, oh, okay. Got, got it? So, solid stuff there, Associated Press. Thank you for reporting on our stupid society. All righty. Well, I hope that you have a wonderful, joyous weekend. John Wick 3, I've been pitching John, they should pay me. I've been pitching John Wick 3 harder than anything that I've pitched in a while. <laughs> I, I can't wait to see it. I'm, I'm going to probably go on Monday to see John Wick 3 with the wife who, shockingly, is into the John Wick movies. I've indoctrinated her into the ways of John Wick. So we'll do that. Also, Game of Thrones. I will give you my final review of Game of Thrones on Monday because the finale is Sunday. Ooh, who's excited? I know everybody's hating on Game of Thrones and not me, man. I'm enjoying this season. I know. I'm an upper for once. Crazy. All right, well, we'll see you here on Monday. Have a wonderful weekend. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Senior producer, Jonathan Hay. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. And our technical producer is Austin Stevens. Edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio is mixed by Mike Caromina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Olvera. Production assistant, Nick Sheehan. The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2019. Hey everyone, I'm Alicia Krause, and we just wrapped a really great episode of this month's conversation with our very own Michael Knowles. You want to tell everybody some of the things that we talked about? I think we might have had one or two questions about abortion. I think maybe that because it's the biggest news story in the whole country. Came up. That came up. We talked about what it means for the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. We talked about 2020 Democrats. We talked about faith and Christianity. And most importantly of all, we talked about cigars and whiskey. Important topics. Much more important than anything else. So head on over to dailywire.com, also available on all of our social media platforms, and including the Michael Knowles page over on iTunes. That's right. Check it out. <laughs> 